In my previous video, in which I presented the final specifications and features of the router we're making, a lot of you, and I mean a lot of you, have asked whether it's possible to have a 2.5 gigabit port on the device. Well, I have some good news and I have some bad news. First off, let me say I wasn't originally planning to make this video, but then I spoke with my wife and explained to her what kind of dilemma I was facing, and you know what she said? Talk to your audience. So here I am talking to you, or more importantly, asking for your opinion on the matter. But before we get there, let's get the good news out of the way first. Yes, we can implement one 2.5 gigabit port, but not in the way we initially thought. If you recall the block diagram for our chosen CPU, the LS1046A, then you probably remember the networking block, which listed two 10 gigabit ports, one 2.5 gigabit and four gigabit ones, right? Well, it turns out there's an up to prefix to all of those. By the way, if you don't really know what the hell I'm talking about, then go ahead and see the previous video first. I'll link it up here, uh, then, can come, then come back with all the necessary context. Anyway, if we check the block diagram, then in order to understand the problems around the, your incredible desire to have that 2.5 gigabit port, and more importantly, the consequences of its implementation, 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 we need to shift our focus to another block called the CERDIS. CERDIS is an integrated circuit or part of one that, as the name suggests, takes care of signal serialization when the signal leaves one chip and signal deserialization when it arrives at another. But why do we need to serialize it in the first place, you might ask? Well, as you'll see in one of the future videos, the most complex part of designing a PCB is routing traces across its layers. And, as you'll also see, these traces, especially the ones that carry high-speed signals such as PCIe and 10 gigabit Ethernet, can be very sensitive to electromagnetic interference, or EMI for short. So what we want to do as PCB designers is to reduce the number of necessary traces to, well, as little as possible, and CERDIS allows us to do just that. We only need four traces for the CERDIS signal to connect two chips. Positive transmit, negative transmit, positive receive, and negative receive. These are what are known as differential pairs and they serve one purpose as in why there are two transmit and two receive lines. As I said, in high speed designs, EMI becomes a big issue that can easily introduce errors in the actual electrical signals that travel through a copper trace on the PCB. But if you take the same signal, invert it, then send it over on another trace in parallel, then at the other side subtract the negative signal from the positive, well, the difference will be twice the voltage, right? Right. And here's the gist of the differential pairs. If the signal on the two traces is somehow impacted by an external interference, then both traces are impacted equally and because of the subtraction of the two signals, this interference cancels itself out between the pair and we still end up with double the voltage or more importantly, a clean signal. It would be magic if it wasn't science. Apart from the decreased number of lines, there's also another benefit to using CERDIS and that's the versatility it brings to the table. As you'll shortly see in more detail, but is clearly visible in the block diagram, is that above this CERDIS block, there are three different possible signal types that it supports. PCI Express, various Ethernet interfaces, and finally, SATA. Because of this, the block diagram we've been talking about in the previous video can also be a bit misleading because it's not possible to have three PCIe version 3 lanes at the same time. And the same goes for the Ethernet interfaces. It's not possible to have both two 10 gigabit interfaces and a 2.5 gigabit one at the same time. So where can we check which combinations are possible? In a document called Reference Manual. You see, integrated circuits or chips most often come with three separate types of documentation. The datasheet, which just gives you the raw facts about the chip's characteristics, such as pinouts, package, or the physical shape it ships in, voltages, vat vatages, wattages, impedances, and so on. If we compare it to a car, it's like brochure saying how fast it goes, uh, how long it gets it, or how long it takes to get it to a certain speed, what kind of gas it consumes, how much it weighs, etc, etc. 
Then we have reference manuals, which as the name suggests are the chip manuals. These go over each and every feature of the chip and describe all possible ways of using these features and how to configure them with registers. Registers are a topic worthy of its own video, maybe even several of them. So what you need to know at this point is that there's a w they are a way of storing data, mostly configuration, in the chip itself. If we use the same car analogy, then the reference manual is similar to the manual that comes with the car, which says how to operate it safely and properly, how to replace a flat tire or mount a new light. And lastly, when it comes to chip documentation, we also have application notes, which we'll also cover in depth in future videos. Application notes are sort of a how-tos, if you will, sometimes even step-by-step -step tutorials on how to integrate a particular chip onto the design of the PCB in the way that manufacturer intended. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss my future videos on this topic. Okay, let's look at the reference manual of the LS1046A and focus on the 30s module, which is on chapter 31. And yes, this chapter is on page 1915 out of approximately 2500 pages. Nobody said integrated circuits are easy. Anyway, for this particular chip, the 30s module is divided into two separate blocks, each having four lanes, and the possible combinations for those lanes, for each block that is, can be found on tables 31-1 and 31-2. Let's focus on the service one block first and check what's possible or maybe more importantly what is not possible. Because the tables don't come with a legend, let me first explain what each of these cells are. XFI is a 10 gigabit interface for SFP plus modules. SGMII is a gigabit interface. 2.5G SGMII then is a 2.5 gigabit interface. Ku SGMII is quad SGMII, meaning we can have 4 gigabit Ethernet ports on one 30s lane. Not any lane, mind you, just the one with the QSGMII interface listed, which in our case is lane B. And lastly, we have a single lane of PCIe version 1. Now that you know what kind of interface combinations we can use in this block, combine that with the fact that our router will support two 10 gigabit ports, which means we're basically left with just these two rows, the one that starts with 1133 and the other one that starts with 1163. But the documentation says it's not possible to use PCIe lanes in both 30s blocks at the same time, which pretty much excludes the row that starts with 1163, so we're left with this one, two 10 gigabit and two 1 gigabit interfaces. So no 2.5 gigabit in this block. But we have another block to look at, right? Yes, but unfortunately for us, this block focuses more on the PCIe and SATA connectivity, only giving us a single possible SGMII interface, which again is capable of just one gigabit per second. Keep this block in mind though, as we will look at two other data sheets first, before circling around, back to this one to wrap this up. The first document is the data sheet of the gigabit PHY chip we'll use, the Max Linear GPY115. If you missed my previous videos on the topic, which I'll link to up here, Phi chips represent the layer one in the OSI model, meaning they're responsible for converting our binary or digital data into electrical impulses that travel through the copper wires. As you can see in this overview diagram for the GPY115, it has the SGMII interface on the host side, which corresponds to the ones that we saw in our SIRDIS block table. And don't worry if you don't understand what most of these other signal slash pins mean, we're going to look at them much more in detail once the time comes to actually implement this particular chip on our PCB. So how does this help us solve the problem of needing a 2.5 gigabit interface on a router? It does not. For that, we have to look at another Phi chip, one that has been recommended to me by the distributor called Marvel AQC115. The chip, not the distributor. If we check the block diagram in their product brief, you can hopefully see one major difference between this one and the one we just looked at. The host interface is not SGMII, it's PCIe. 
and that is the win we've been looking for. If we now go back to our 32 combinations table, you can notice this row that starts with 5577 and has two lanes of PCIe3. Well, if we go back to the Marvel product brief, you can see that this particular Phi chip supports that very same connection to the host. But the good news don't end there. A single lane of PCIe version 3 can transfer up to 1 gigabyte of data per second, which is 8 gigabits. But because we have two PCIe 3 lanes between the CPU and the Phi chip, we can easily replace the 2.5 gigabit chip with either a 5 or even a 10 gigabit one. Amazing, right? Well, yes, but unfortunately there is a drawback. If we go with my initially proposed configuration of two 10 gigabit ports and three gigabit ones, then to drive each of these ports, we need three max linear Phi chips, each of those costing around $2. However, if we replace one of these chips with a Marvel 2.5 gigabit one, which costs around $15 per chip, then this move increases the final price of the device by approximately $25 to $30 if we add the necessary margin. And if we replace the 2.5 gigabit Phi with a 5 gigabit one, which is also possible with this approach, it goes up even further to about or by about $40 to $50 just for that one single port. Furthermore, I asked uh, the support over at NXP and they confirmed my suspicion. If we connect this Phi chip to the PCIe lanes rather than SGMII, like the rest of them, then the incoming traffic will not be processed by the DPAA hardware we talked about in the previous video. That being said though, with four cores being available to us, I don't think that's going to be an issue. So I guess what I'm asking all of you at this point is the following. Is replacing a single gigabit port for a 2.5 or potentially even a 5 gigabit one worth that increase in price? To you. If the majority of you goes hell yeah down in the comments, well, then we'll do it. Period. But once this device actually gets released, you better do buy it, otherwise I'll be seriously pissed off. <laughs> Anyway, before we wrap this up, let's go back to our 32 table because there's also two lanes we have yet to account for and it's these two, PCIe 1x1 and PCIe 2x1. Because we can configure the CPU to use the 2x1 in the 1x1 configuration, meaning we end up with a PCIe 1x2 with these two combined, we can and will use them, you guessed it, in our M.2 socket that we plan to put on the board. M.2 sockets, if you didn't know, come in three different variants which are also keyed differently. Keying in this context means where the notch or several of them are. If you used or mounted an M.2 NVMe SSD before, then you most likely used key M, which supports socket 3, which in turn supports four PCIe lanes, whereas the other two possible sockets, so socket 1 and socket 2, do not. But we'll use one of them anyway, uh, socket 1 that is, which supports key E. As you can see in this table, key E needs two PCIe by one lanes that we can use in the Surdis block 2, and it also supports some other interfaces that our CPU does have, such as UART, I2C, and USB. The reason we'll go with socket 1 is that key E is the most popular approach used by third-party developers of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and NFC M.2 modules and since we're making a router, makes the most sense for us to support. And all of this also brings us to the reason why the device will not support SATA. Well, other than the fact that this is a router we're making and not a mini server as some of you might think according to the comments. There will be no SATA because we simply do not have any interfaces left to implement it. So this one block is taken for two 10 gigabit and two 1 gigabit interfaces and so this two block is taken for the 2.5 gigabit port and the M.2 socket. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.